Hello friends and welcome back to my art channel. Today we are going to be reviewing Stuart Simple's World's Coloriest Watercolor Palette and we're going to put that to the test. So here's a quick unboxing. I really like the packaging. It is very slick. It is very Stuart Simple and uh, you'll see when you first open the box it comes with a handy swatch card which we are going to immediately discard because it's worthless. It has a nice little snap-on palette. It's got four little divots that you can put it into that we're not going to use because I just kind of balance it on the top half. But if you need more mixing space, cool. Here's a quick swatch to check the colors and check their opacity. I did speed this up quite a bit. Uh, you can see that the names are silly and uh, a side effect of that is I have no idea what pigments are in any of these because they don't have standard names and there's no pigment information available on their website. It does say on the site that they are high quality, they are artist grade, and they are light fast, but without knowing what the actual pigments are, there is literally no way to know that except for, you know, testing it yourself. So I haven't tested these for light fastness yet because that takes like a month and I wanted to, you know, make this video. Then again, I've had the palette for three months. So I guess I could have done that by now. I just didn't. Haha, ha, take that past me. You didn't plan well. So we're actually getting to the three weakest colors on the palette here. Pink, Bowie, and Dropout. Uh, they just don't have a lot of color payoff. You have to really dig to get them to work. But the rest of the colors do live up to their name of very coloriest palette. I don't know. Stuart Simple likes to make up words. Anyway, uh, his whole thing is having the coloriest color. So it's actually very disappointing that the pink is so weak because he has a pink pigment that is the world's pinkest pink and it's much stronger than this one. Um, and I have non Stuart Simple pinks that are way stronger that are student grade uh, or artist grade. I have a Daniel Smith opera that's way more vibrant than this. So the pink is very disappointing. Bowie is disappointing and Dropout is disappointing, though I will say in Dropout's defense, I have never had a lavender pigment that was particularly strong that wasn't like mixed with a white. So if he was trying to keep it with a pure pigment, I guess maybe that's okay. Also, I think Dirtbag and Void are switched on the swatch card it comes with because Dirtbag is the black and Void is the gray and they are the other way on the included swatch card. That or my pans are backwards, so who's to say? Anyway, here's some aesthetic water pouring. This is a Faber-Castell uh, collapsible water cup, and this is a paint jar I got for a dollar at Michael's, I think. So here's the palette. Uh, after three months of use, I don't like doing first impressions videos because my first impression is often wrong. So I have been using this palette on and off. Uh, I have been trying to get the, a hang of it, figure out what its strengths are and where its weaknesses are. And you can see it's now a big mess. Uh, so we're going to take our little spray bottle and we're going to wet these paints ahead of time. This helps to activate them as opposed to putting water on the brush and trying to go out the pan dry. Don't do that. Put some water on it first. Uh, also, I won't be reviewing their brush today. I will be using these Mimic brushes, uh, which you can get at Jerry's Artorama. These come in their sample pack. This is a Royal and Lagnical chisel brush. Those are super cheap. You can get them at Michael's and they're very good. And these are Princeton brushes. One is round and one is flat. And that's not the names of the brushes. I can't remember what brushes are called. Today we'll be using B Paper's 100% cotton watercolor paper. I tend to use this when I don't care super much about like the result. Um, so this is the first thing I ever did with these. As you can see, the shadows are not very dark, but the blues and greens are very vibrant. Uh, I was hoping to push the blues a little bit darker, but there's not really an indigo in this set. And I really don't like mixing blacks in my palette. Um, and this one has two blacks or I guess a black, a gray and a white. And I don't think any of those are necessary. Um, this is a landscape study by Pazarine. It's actually from a Sims build. And this is a picture of my OC where I was also trying to get the colors to go darker than they would go. So anyway, um, we're going to start doing some flowers with the super weak colors in this palette because I decided for the illustration I wanted to play to its strengths. But I also want you guys to see how these perform in an actual painting. So like they are certainly usable. They just aren't as punchy as the rest of the palette. And so they feel kind of out of place and disappointing to me. In general, I feel like this palette has way more colors than you need. And a lot of them are very similar to each other, just kind of different hues of the same color, especially in the blues. Like always in dive are the same color, just 
always is a little bit punchier. King Zulu in 1980 are kind of redundant, and Zoltar and Alchemy are just kind of two shades of the same blue. I'm sure they're different pigments. Well, actually, I'm not sure because there's no pigment information. Her, her, her. Anyway, um, I would have preferred a smaller set with a more diverse range of colors. Like, this one doesn't really have any dark tones other than the black, and most watercolor artists I know don't like to use black. So I would have preferred a Payne's Gray or a Indigo uh, over a dirt bag, whatever hue that is supposed to be. <laughs> um, and I would have just left the white out altogether. I would have maybe done this as a 24 set. Like my biggest personal palette has 18 pigments in it. Um, and I only ever use like six on any given painting. So 36 kind of feels more like a novelty than a feature to me here. Uh, and it just kind of speaks to this palette feeling a little weird to use. Though it does have some highlights, like there are a lot of really punchy blues, there are a lot of nice reds, um, and the green selection is very nice, though maybe a little bit too much. I think Emerald City and Venom could have been one pan instead of two. Uh, again, I would have curated this set a little bit more closely and maybe in the future they'll do smaller ones. Like I would know I would definitely like to see like a 24 option maybe from Stort Simple, though I know he is more into pigments and acrylic than he is to watercolor. So anyway, let's get into the actual painting. I mixed up a skin tone here, I believe using Bullion, Akhenaten, and Stump. I believe it was Stump, not Nugget. Um, and I also put a little bit of Runaway in there, I believe. And this character, I picked her because her palette happens to suit very well to the strengths of this palette. It's got a lot of warmer blues. It's got a lot of punchy red in her hair. Spoilers, she has red hair. Um, and I thought it would be a good fit for this, which is also why I wanted to do the flowers so that y'all could see uh, the weaknesses of the palette because they're not going to really be on strong display here. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about this character because I will take any excuse to talk about her. This is Regan Kayyem. She's a human fighter. I'm kind of basic and I really enjoy playing human fighters. They are kind of my favorite class combination uh, because they are deceptively simple. Like it's pretty easy to run one, but I think it's difficult to run one well. And I take a lot of pride at this point in the fact that I can, because I played this character for two and a half years, I believe. Uh, the campaign is not over, but it's been on hiatus for a bit. We even made the first quote unquote season of it into a podcast called Masks and Martyrs, which was very fun to do. I learned a lot about audio editing, but back to the painting. Uh, this is a character I've actually painted and drawn probably upwards of a thousand times. I got very into drawing art for this campaign for years, so uh, it is appropriate that she is making an appearance on my art channel because I owe a lot of my art skill over the last couple of years to working on art for this game specifically. Um, so here, I believe the colors I am using, the base one here is a Zoltar, and then I'm using Alchemy for the shading. I think I might have mixed a little bit of the purple, of one of the purples in there, maybe Slave, to get a darker tone. Uh, I actually was pleased with the dark tones I was able to get here. This palette is good for shading, it's just not great for trying to get like an overall dark tone. Like I showed you guys the two paintings I did that were an attempt to do go with a darker atmosphere. Um, and it's not great for that, but it's good for doing these small areas of dark like this. I was able to get a very dark indigo color. Again, I think it would be easier if there just were an indigo in this palette. Um, I lean very heavily on indigo and Payne's Gray in my main palette, so I guess I'm a little spoiled and I guess I was missing them when I was working with this palette over the last couple of months. So maybe I should just view this as a exercise in getting out of my comfort zone uh, as opposed to a challenge of the palette. If you don't rely on those colors as heavily as I do, maybe this is a good palette for you. Um, so as far as like who I think this palette is for, it feels like this palette is more for people who have worked with Stuart Semple's palettes, or sorry, his pigments in the past, or just are fans of his work. and who want to try out watercolor as opposed to mixing the colors he sells as pure pigments with water, or I guess you could mix them with gum arabic and make pans out of them as well. But basically the bottom line is this feels like a watercolor palette 
for people who don't paint with watercolors. Um, it seems like a watercolor palette meant for people who are experimenting and maybe trying to get out of their acrylic comfort zone or that are fans of Stuart Semple and they have a friend who likes to do watercolor so they pick up this palette for them. I wouldn't recommend this set for a beginner for a lot of reasons. One is when you're a beginner you don't need like high, highly light fast paint or anything crazy fancy you can get by with pretty much anything uh but specifically i recommend starting with a much smaller set of colors because you need to learn to mix colors when you are doing watercolor at first uh in this set while i do mix I, I don't think i've used a pure pigment anywhere on this piece so far in the painting i do later but you need to learn how to mix a lot of colors and this one is a little too unwieldy to be easy to learn on. And I'm very much speaking from experience here. The first watercolor palette that I had was from Art and & Fly and I believe it had 36 colors and I got so overwhelmed trying to learn on that set. And also the pigments weren't super high quality. Those big novelty sets very rarely are, though the Stuart Semple one is an exception. But it just had too many colors, it was very unwieldy to use, and I put it away and didn't look at it for like a year and ended up buying smaller sets over time to learn on instead. So I recommend going with something very basic and you can just get Crayola paints. I'm gonna be real with you, those are perfectly fine for beginning, um, though I will link a slightly more advanced set, I guess, in the description below from Paul Rubens. There's a picture of it on the screen right now. I am not affiliated with them, but I learned on their 24 set, like when I got really serious about watercolors and I'm a big fan of their student grade pans and their tube watercolors are professional grade and I find that they hold up just as well as my Daniel Smith and much more expensive paints. So I'm a big fan of their brand and that bundle happens to come with a 100% cotton watercolor sketchbook. Uh, and 100% cotton paper is always going to make your watercolor look a lot better. And if you're using a bad paper for watercolor, you're going to think you're a lot worse at watercolor than you actually are. So I recommend getting that bundle or just getting any watercolor. Like again, Crayola is perfectly fine. It has everything you need. Um, and then getting a nicer paper because that way you know that the problem is not the paper. Um, I started trying to learn on very cheap watercolor papers and it took me a very long time to realize that I was not the problem. So yeah, basically, if you're just starting out, invest in paper, not paint. You can make any paint look good on good paper, but bad paper can make high quality paint look absolutely terrible. Uh, so as far as what you actually want to look for, if you're just starting out with watercolor and you want to get a beginner's set, uh, and Crayola sets pretty much have all of these bases covered, you want your three primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, and you want them in warm and cool varieties. And yes, there are cool yellows. It's called lemon yellow, and it's my least favorite color, but you do need it. <laughs> so you want warm and cool primaries. You want to get a yellow ochre in there, uh, a brown of some kind. Usually you're going to have a burnt sienna in there. And then I prefer to have sets with a turquoise and a purple in there because I find those are tricky to mix as well as a pure pigment looks. So it's just gonna be a little bit easier. Turquoise especially is very tricky to mix. You can also get a white and a black in there. Most beginner sets are going to have those. I don't really use white a lot, except when you are trying to mix periwinkle, lavender, and pink. I find it is nice to have a white. Otherwise, the white of your paper is going to do all of the heavy lifting in terms of lightening your pigments. So you're just gonna be watering stuff down as opposed to adding white to it. I see a lot of people keep a tube of white gouache on hand because you can use that to easily make a watercolor color opaque and that's handy to have as opposed to having it in your palette. So like if you were to get the Paul Rubens set, for example, and you're worried about not having a white, pick up a, a tube of white gouache instead. Uh, and I think you'll get a lot of use out of that. It's also fun for adding highlights and stuff. And that's basically it. And black is fine. I believe the Paul Rubens set I linked comes with a Payne's Gray instead. And I think that is a much nicer color to mix with. And eventually you will learn to mix your own blacks and you won't need them in your palettes. 
Oh, and greens. Almost every basic set will come with a sap green and some darker shade of green that is a cool green, and those are very important to have as well, and I literally always forget about the color green for some reason. It used to be my least favorite color, I have started to appreciate it a lot more. Um, you can mix those out of the primaries, but it's nice to have a sap green and a darker green on hand. So yeah, that's basically the only colors you really need need, or at least the only colors that I use very frequently. So would I recommend this palette for a beginner? No. If you are, however, you know, into watercolors and you collect palettes or you just want to add some really punchy colors to your selection, yeah, I think that these are a nice supplement to your existing watercolor collection. Uh, I have really enjoyed, again, the blues and reds in this set. They're just like, mwah, they're beautiful. So I really enjoy having this set in my collection. I enjoy using it and it's a bit of a challenge for me too, which is nice. It helps me to learn more about colors that I normally shy away from. And I really like using it just for studying and especially for landscapes because the green selection here is also very lush. So if you are a beginner, I would say maybe get this set after you've mastered a 12 set if you want to add a lot of vibrancy to your palette. Uh, but yeah, it's a nice set of paint. It is not a jack of all trades, but most things are not. Uh, and if you're a jack of all trades, you're usually a master of none. And I say that as a jack of all trades myself. If I'm making dinner, I would rather do it with a, you know, steak knife or whatever than with a Swiss army knife. So different tools for different purposes. And this palette is certainly a great tool to get some very punchy colors into your palette at a lower price than you would be getting them from like Daniel Smith, for example, which is, again, just a very expensive brand. I know Holbein and Schmincke are some other popular brands. And this one is definitely a lot cheaper than those and they sell them at cost, apparently. This is a non-profit set. So I think that's pretty cool. And I think Stuart Semple is a very fun artist and I think his energy is great. So yeah. So my final thoughts on this palette. It was good and I liked it. This concludes my book report. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But it is a fun palette. I've really enjoyed the time I've spent with it. As you can see here, I'm trying desperately to get that dropout color to show up as like a little background. And it just makes the contrast between the good colors in this palette and dropout so stark. You can barely see it. Um, you'll see the scanned version of this image in just a moment here. And it just didn't even show up in my scanner. It was like, no, that's just white, right? And I was like, no, it's not. So uh, yeah. I would, if I were Stuart Semple, I would replace the dropout pigment and the pink pigment and the Bowie pigment. Um, so now I'm just going to go in and finish touching this up with some colored pencils. Uh, I managed to get a darker shade of indigo than my Faber-Castell's dark indigo pencil, which is usually the darkest color I have in my palette. So that was cool. I actually went in with some black here, which is unusual for me. Um, this did end up a little bit skewed because the sketchbook was flat on the table and I made some mistakes even though I had sketched it properly. So I touched it up digitally and the scan that you see at the end will be that touched up version. I highly recommend colored pencils for finishing really any kind of artwork. I use them very heavily both in my marker and watercolor work and it is how I do line art without actually doing line art because I typically, this is not always the case, sometimes I do full ink line art but I don't always love how it looks and I don't have a lot of confidence in my line work. So this is a way to get a softer look. You can really use any kind of pencils for this. I mean, Crayola works fine. I think I'm using Faber-Castell Prismacolor and a Tombow Edo G10 pencil here. Um, and I have more of all of those, but you really only need a couple colors. Usually I go with a dark indigo, a sepia, and a black. And that is more than I need to finish sketching out my details. And I did go in with a little bit of ink towards the end here for the eyes, which is very typical of me. I like having those dark mascara eyelashes, even though this is a D&D &D fighter and she does not have access to mascara. And then of course the white gel pen shows up. Uh, this is a Sakura Jelly Roll. My favorite one is the Uniball Signo, but I don't have a thin one. So yeah, this is the finished illustration.
Thank you all so much for watching this video all the way to the end. I want to thank especially my sister-in-law and my brother for getting me this paint palette for Christmas. And sorry it took me so long to review it, but they know I've been using it. I've sent them pictures I've done with it. And uh, if you liked this video and want to see more like it, uh, like and subscribe and hit the notification bell so that every time I make a sin against God, you are notified instantly. Uh, that's going to be all for this one. Next week, we're going to look at the Ohuhu brush pastel markers, and I will see you then with my pink soft Muppet hands. Bye!